What is it really like to be a marine biologist? I hear this question a lot. So if you talk to any one particular marine biologist, they're gonna have different experiences, right? And it just really depends on what you're working on. You know, you could be working on studying whales and sea turtles that move uh, across a global scale. And you could be studying the tiniest creatures at the bottom of the ocean, you know, maybe some sort of amphipods or polychaetes. Maybe you're working in the icy blue waters of the Arctic, or maybe you're working in warm tropical waters. This is really just the beauty of it, right? Is that there, the diversity is so unbelievable. So, and also it's important to realize that some people do research on different species or ecosystems or habitats. You could also be helping populations, for example, rare species or species that we use as food and making sure that they're managed appropriately. Or maybe you're doing conservation work. You're trying to conserve different habitats like corals, or maybe you are rehabilitating animals. So as you can see, all of these will be different experiences. And I've been a marine biologist for 28 years and I've had a lot of different jobs and different types of experiences. And I also have a lot of colleagues that have had different experiences. And I do plan on interviewing some of my colleagues later on and so you can learn from them too. In this video, I'm gonna talk about one type of research that I was involved in for a while. But actually I've done so many different things. So this is just one of many videos that we'll be talking about my specific experience. For this video, I'm gonna talk about the first job that I got, it was full time, working for National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. I'm gonna call it NOAA for short. And this was right after I got my bachelor's degree. And I had volunteered there before and I actually have a bunch of videos about the importance of volunteering, but that is how I got this job. Now the place I worked, NOAA, does a lot of research and is also responsible for the marine resources in the United States waters. I worked for a smaller group inside of NOAA called the National Marine Fisheries Service. They actually do employ a lot of marine biologists throughout the United States. So this agency is responsible for managing and protecting basically most of the marine resources in U.S. waters. So I worked in a benthic ecology research group. And benthic ecology is the study of animals and plants that live on the bottom of the ocean floor. And that could be in shallow waters or it could be in very deep waters. Turns out these benthic communities can really tell us a lot about the health of the overall ocean ecosystem. Our working group consisted of three main researchers that had their PhD, and there were about 10 full-time employees that mainly had bachelor's degrees. And there were numerous graduate students that worked out of the lab as well, working on their own research projects and sometimes helping us with our research as well. So they also, there was also a manager of the Benthic Lab and that person coordinated all of the research projects and all the equipment that was needed in the, when you go out in the field or in the laboratory and made sure it was all purchased and where it was where it was needed to be and also worked with others to make sure the boats were in working order and also just um, manage the staff, you know, both in the field and the laboratory. I initially worked there as a full-time staff member. And then when I got my master's degree, I was actually promoted to the benthic lab manager role for a while. So we had a lot of different marine ecology projects. Our jurisdiction was basically the Gulf of Mexico. So we would do projects from the Everglades of Florida all the way to near the U.S.-Mexico border. So this story, I'm gonna talk about a typical field trip that we would go on. And this is only one research project 
that we did and also I'm really focusing today on the field work because there is a big laboratory component to this study and I'll talk about that in other videos. So this study occurred in seagrass beds in a place called Laguna Madre which is very near the Mexico US border in Texas and we did have to travel. We, our laboratory was in Galveston and we traveled to Port Isabel, which is a very tiny town. And we, we stayed there for a week. Now, if you keep up with Elon Musk, he's actually doing some rocket testing these days near some of our old sample sites. Anyway, we stayed there for a week. We collected data on environmental conditions like dissolved oxygen and salinity. And then we also measured what animals were using seagrass beds. And these are mainly small shrimp, crabs, and fish. Like I said, for this project, we worked in seagrass beds and we had natural ones and then we had ones that were transplanted. We were trying to compare what animals were using the transplanted beds versus the natural beds. Our funding came from another government agency called the Army Corps of Engineers. So they are in charge of creating and maintaining the navigable waterways in the United States. Part of that is they create and maintain all of the boating and shipping channels throughout the US. So this can include the large shipping channels and then also includes some of the smaller channels that are like in the estuaries that are really used for a lot of recreational boating. These are like the highways of the near shore environment. A lot of times if the water is deep enough, the boats can go wherever they want to, but especially in these shallow areas of estuaries and near, near the coast, they do have to dredge the channels to be able to make it deep enough for some of the boats to go where they want to go. And anything that the US government does it needs to go through a process to assess environmental harm of the project. It's called the National Environmental Protection Act or NEPA. So a lot of these channels they create are actually in seagrass beds or near seagrass beds and so they have to figure out how are they going to mitigate the harm done to these seagrass beds. So what they do sometimes is they'll plant new seagrass beds in nearby areas to make up for the damage that these channels create. So our goal in this project is we were comparing how these planted beds function versus the natural beds and are they good habitat for a lot of the species of fish, shrimp, and crabs that are using the natural habitat, how many of them are using the, the transplanted habitats, and how long does it take before planted beds act just like the natural beds. One of the things about doing marine biology research is that there's always something that happens when you go out in the field that you don't expect. There's definitely a lot of uncertainty when you go out in the field because you have all the elements that you're dealing with. You have the weather, you have your boat, that you have your equipment that may or may not work, you have your staff. You really have to be a good team. It seems like there's always something unexpected that happens. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but there's always something. So I wanted to tell you the story. One day when we went out to sample the seagrass beds for this project, so we had a two-hour boat ride to our sample sites. So we got everybody together, we have all the equipment that we needed, and we headed out I was the lab manager at the time, so I had to make sure that everything was on the boat and make sure everybody was okay. The PhD was the main researcher, and he was there to direct the research activities. It took us two hours to get out to our site where we were going to sample the seagrass beds. And about halfway there, one of my staff members came up to me and said that she had forgotten her EpiPen that she was really very allergic to bee stings. I did not know this. So I thought about it and I thought about how we never ever, not only do we not see bees, but we rarely even see the land. 
in our sampling sites. You know, we might have a, like a little sliver over along the horizon of the land and that's as close as we get. So I made the choice. We were very, very far away from any kind of hospital or any kind of civilization, but I made the choice to go ahead and go and just with the idea that we're never going to see a bee out there, right? It's, we're out in the middle of the lagoon. There is no land around us whatsoever. So everything went fine. We did all of our samples that day, no problem. We were headed back and we see this guy, his boat is stuck in the marsh and he has a distress flag up. I think it was just some clothing, I think sweatpants that were white is the distress signal. And we knew we were the only ones that are going to be in that area at all, probably all week. And who knows how long he had been out there. So we went over to help him and as soon as we get up to the boat, I could tell it was just a really unusual boat. It was just the hull. I don't think it was fully a whole boat and he had all these things in it. So he had an outboard motor. It was very small for the size of the boat. And then he had like these different things that you would need electricity for, like an exercise bike. He had a microwave. And he had these suitcases lined up. And as soon as we came up to his boat, we start to see these bees. Now, I don't know if he had a beehive on there too. I don't know, he was a very unusual person. But anyway, we start seeing these bees and they start flying around. And of course, they go straight to the staff members hair and get in stuck in there. And so I think sometimes like you have smelly shampoo or something that can attract them. But anyway, they were all in our hair and I just, it was very scary. So I had to pull all of these out of her hair one by one, very gently, not to upset them. We got them all out and we hurried up, hooked him up to our, the boat and then we pulled him back. It took us four hours to get back because we were pulling this bigger boat behind us. And so, and on the way back, every once in a while, we'd see this bee that would zoom us. <laughs> and I really think maybe he had a beehive in there. But we dropped him off at the Coast Guard station and went on our merry way and everybody was fine and no bee stings. But it was really one of those exciting days. <laughs> so thanks for watching.